passed away. You should see me now on the screen. Oh, hi. Um, so far, we have about 100 folks on uh, and more gathering. Uh, and so uh, we're going to be getting started. Uh, I want to introduce you a little bit to the features. This is a new webinar service we're using. It's um, very high tech. Um, all of you should be seeing on your right-hand side um, a dashboard panel. That'll give you access to a chat box in which you can ask questions, give us feedback uh, during the webinar. Uh, we might not be able to respond instantly, but we will want to take the time to do question and answer, so feel free to pop questions there. You'll also see a question box that you're welcome to use, and that's um, another way that we will be able to uh, get to your questions. Uh, we want to make this as interesting and interactive as possible. And so um, now and then throughout the webinar, we are going to be offering um, polls like this one, which I'll be launching now. And let's see. If folks just want to click on the answer to let us know kind of where in the country you are, let's see. Right now, we have 7% from New England, 13, 16, 17% from Central East, 16% from the Southern Region, 25% from Mid-America, and 35% in the Pacific Western Region. So this is very exciting. Um, we have about 82% of you have voted. So uh, if any more want to vote, let us know where you are. Um, All right, we have one more poll to get a sense of where folks are. We'd like to ask you, um, do you personally know, let me stop my screen sharing. Sorry about that, we have a poll in progress. Um, do you know anybody personally who has been detained or their friends and family? 51% um, of you have said yes, 46 have said no, 8% are unsure. Now it looks like 45% have said yes, 46 said no, and 8% uh, are unsure. Uh, excellent. All right, and I'm going to pass this over to Dan, uh, Dan Fermansky is standing on the side of love, and he will um, get us started. Hi. Audra, am I on? Can you see you, me? You are on, and now I am handing over the screen to you. Excellent. Hi, everybody. Hello. I wish everybody could, I could hear everybody saying hi back, but I'm imagining it. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Dan Fermansky. I'm the campaign manager for this great campaign, Standing on the Side of Love, which uh, most of you hopefully know is an interfaith campaign of the Unitarian the Universalist Association. I'm thrilled to say that 328 people have registered for this evening's webinar from all across the country. People are continuing to join us online. Some are uh, with us just by phone. Uh, we have clergy, lay leaders, uh, UUs and non-UUs, we have those who are part of a congregation and those who are not. We also have folks who are deeply engaged with migrant justice issues and those who are just getting started in this work. Uh, so, Audra, I'm going to introduce you, if I may. Audra is the program coordinator for the Office of Congregational Advocacy and Witness. Uh, she is uh, the queen of all things, as I call her. Uh, and she will be our guide for the webinar this evening, technologically speaking. Uh, so she'll be chiming in and out and, of course, helping us through the Q&A portion. I also want to introduce uh, my colleague, Susan Leslie, who is the Director of Congregational Advocacy and Witness. Uh, Susan, of course, has been with the UUA for more than 20 years uh, and is one of the lead organizers. And she is uh, a great person to connect with if there are questions that arise after this evening's webinar. Susan can be reached at slesley at uua.org, S-L-E-S-L-I-E at uua.org. 
Now, there are already some UU congregations around the country that participate in public witness at detention centers, and we're increasingly hearing from individuals and congregations that they are starting a visitation program. So now really is the time to start organizing and building a network of people across the country supporting individuals in detention and their families, while at the same time working to expose the cold facts behind how these centers operate, and working to end the detention and deportation programs overall. It is my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's facilitator uh, of the webinar, Bob Leibol, who has been a professional social justice advocate since graduating from the University of Texas almost 10 years ago. Um, if we have any folks from Texas, uh, Bob is your neighbor in Austin and uh, brings some pride Brian tonight. Uh, Bob is the new executive director of Grassroots Leadership, which is an organization doing amazing work that Bob will tell you about this evening. Uh, and he asked me not to go on and on about him, and he said he would blush, but I'm going to just tell you a few high points. Uh, Bob has actually been an organizer with Grassroots Leadership for many years, advocating for federal detention reform and against private prison expansion, as well as an end to immigrant family detention. And his efforts have been successful in contributing to the end of family detention at a detention center in Taylor, Texas. He currently serves as co-chair of the National Detention Watch Network. And he has authored numerous tracts on the issue of private prisons, including a resource guide for elected officials to find positive alternatives to privatization and incarceration. Uh, Bob, we are so honored that you could be with us this evening and share your wisdom with this great community, and I will pass it off to you. Great. Thank you, Dan. Um, can everybody hear me? I'm going to assume that's yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, Um, I'm really pleased to be here. This is a new technology to me as well. So, um, um, I'm I'm simply inspired yeah, by the education justice. Um, hey, Bob. Uh, this is yeah. This is Audra Friend. We're having some problems hearing you. I'm hearing a lot of feedback. Um, I don't know if you have computer speakers on potentially, or and now unfortunately I don't hear you at all. Oh. I don't know if it's possible to call in um, once more on a different line. Anywhere. Um. Audra, I'm kicking it back to you. Wonderful. Thank you. Can you now hear me? I can now hear you. OK. Um, well, I also hear a lot um, of feedback. I don't know if you've got a speaker on or the computer speaker's on. How is this? Um, I think that's better. Why don't I get the webinar started? OK. And um, I have got our PowerPoint running. Terrific. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, and again, um, I think I was, I was saying that I'm consistently inspired by the dedication of the UUs and the Standing on the Side of Love campaign. Um, I've been able to attend the last couple general assemblies, and, and we've been able to present there. And it's been a really fabulous experience. Um, you all really do show up, and you all um, uh, really do um, stand on the side of love in, in the best possible way. Um, I want to particularly thank uh, Dan and Audra and Susan for pulling this call together. I also want to thank uh, my colleague, Rocio Villalobos, who is on the, the call with me. 
um, and Jamie, um, who was someone who uh, we visited in detention um, here at the Tidon Hutto Detention Center. They'll be speaking in a little bit. I also want to thank David Fricaro from the National Visitation Network, who's really one of the um, leading voices on this from a faith perspective and from a, um, a social justice perspective. Um, he's been one of the, the leaders in the visitation movement for a long time. And Jan Meslin from Tapestry UU and Mission Viejo, who um, uh, has just started a visitation program in the last couple of years. And we've had the really wonderful pleasure of working with Jan recently. Um, can we go to the next slide, Audra? Um, so Grassroots Leadership uh, is a 30-year-old social justice organization that has worked to build social justice organizations in the South and Southwest. Um, and we've tried to work across lines of race and gender and class and sexual orientation, the lines that really often div uh, divide our movements. Um, about 15 years ago, um, we were looking at some of the most important issues in the areas where we were working in the South and the Southwest. And we realized that the rise of the private for-profit prison industry and mass incarceration was something that was devastating many of the communities that we were working in, particularly African American and Latino communities. And so we took on a campaign to end for-profit incarceration um, and, to re and to reduce the number of people who are being funneled into the prison criminal justice and immigration detention facility. Um, and the faith community, including the UUs, have really been key to, um, to, to, to many of those campaigns. Um, this has been a, a, a really long-term campaign um, to focus on the impact of the for-profit private prison system on um, pushing laws that incarcerate more and more people, including immigrants in detention. And so the slide we have in front of us now deals with the facts about detaining immigrants in the United States. Um, on any given day, there are more than 34,000 people who are detained in the U.S. Um, solely because of their immigration status. Those people could be people who are apprehended at the border, um, tr trying to attempt to uh, cross into the border without authorization. They could be long-term legal permanent residents with even very minor criminal convictions. They could be asylum seekers, um, people um, who've come to this, this country seeking a better life, who are thrown into detention centers. Um, and the result of that, the, the, many of these laws has really been in a dramatic expansion in the number of detention facilities around the country. You see in front of you now a map from the Detention Watch Network that shows, um, that, that shows the sheer number of detention facilities. I mean, it's really very dramatic. And these detention facilities vary from very large private prisons or public detention centers to a county jail that may be in your backyard, um, where Immigration and Customs Enforcement detains people awaiting immigration hearings. Um, one of those um, is the Hutto is the Tidon Hutto Detention Center in Taylor, Texas. Um, this is a detention facility that was a family immigrant detention facility. Um, after a multi-year campaign by grassroots leadership and many other organizations, family detention was ended at the facility, but it remains a facility that detains uh, women from around the country, including asylum-seeking women. Um, and it was, um, it was in an effort to really deepen our relationships with the women who are detained at Hutto that two years ago we started the Hutto Visitation Program. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Rocio Villalobos, who's going to talk a little bit about um, the Hutto Visitation Program and what some of the goals of the Visitation Program are. Here's Rocio. Hi, everyone. This is Rocio Villalobos. Um, thank you all for being a part of the webinar. I've been involved with the Visitation Program for uh, the past two years now, and I've been coordinating the Visitation Program for a little over a year and a half now. And the Huddle Visitation Program has four goals. Um, if you can go back to the previous slide, um, our four goals are to break the isolation of detention, to service human rights monitors inside of detention centers, to build advocates for detention reform, and to refuse a system that defines human beings as illegal. And just a quick note about um, 
the goal to build advocates for detention reform. I know a couple of groups that do visitation want to create uh, a kind of division between the visitation program itself and then the organizing aspect. And one way that we've done that is through our sister coalition, Texans United for Families, which does community organizing around immigration detention and just recently went on a tour of several detention centers in Houston in order to come up with a series of expo expose and close reports um, in conjunction with the Detention Watch Network and other visitation program groups. OK, you can go on to the next slide. Um, so just to give you a quick overview of who is detained at HEDO, uh, right now it is all women, many of whom are seeking asylum. The majority are apprehended at the border between Texas and Mexico. They're mostly from Central America, and most of the women that we visited are from Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. However, we have seen an increase in the number of women who are from Asia and Africa, and we are now working on trying to recruit more volunteers that speak some of those languages so that we're able to reach some of the women who are really the most isolated because they don't speak Spanish or English. Uh, and right now, the average stay at HEDO is anywhere from two to six months, so we've certainly met women who have been there for a year, a year and a half, even two years. Um, and so the women appreciate having that, that connection to the outside world and, and that kind of support from community members. Next slide. So one of the women that I visited at Hutto is named Jamie, who is joining us here this evening. And Jamie is originally from Honduras, and she came to the U.S. fleeing state and domestic violence. Uh, she came to the to the United States. She ultimately ended up um, having a daughter here, even though she had left four children behind in Honduras. And um, upon trying to return to Honduras due to a family emergency and then coming back into the U.S., she was apprehended. So she was then not only separated from her family in Honduras, she was also separated from her family in, uh, in the U.S. And it took many, many months for her to be released. She was up, she was detained at HEDO for about a year. Thankfully, she was released in December of last year. She won her asylum case. Um, but even then, you know, some of the, there's, there's struggles that continue even long after women have been released in getting support. Um, but now I will hand it over to Jamie. I'll ask her a couple of questions about her experience at HEDO and, and with visitation just so that you can get an idea of what uh, what her experience was like, and, and just some thoughts through her eyes. Uh, Jamie, um, ¿cuál fue tu reacción cuando yo te empecé a visitar? Jamie, what was your reaction when I first started visiting you? La experiencia que tuve cuando me fueron a visitar las personas de Ajaro, una experiencia muy, o sea, me sentí alegre porque tenía alguien que me fuera a visitar porque casi no tenía gente, familiares para que me visitaran. Y la verdad, pues me sentí que tenía noticias de la gente de afuera que no fueran los mismos que me cuidaran. Para mí fue una experiencia muy bonita, la verdad. Uh, Jamie shared that um, she felt really happy when she received a visit because she didn't really have anyone else that was going to visit her. And having that connection to the outside world was a way to know about what was going on outside of the facility. Um, being detained at Hedo, she only spoke, obviously, with the other women who were there. But having a visitors from the outside allowed her to feel that connection to the outside world and not feel as isolated. Um, entonces, ¿no recibiste muchas visitas de amigos o de familiares cuando estuviste detenida? ¿O qué, qué tan seguido fueron a visitarte? Yeah. And I, I asked her um, if she received many visits from friends or family members while she was detained or if anyone else was able to go and visit her. Estuve por un año detenida y solo tenía una amiga que me llevaba a mi hija. Pero creo que en un año nada más tuve tres visitas en todo el tiempo que estuve ahí. Uh, so she said that she had a friend who was in the area that could go and visit her and took her daughter with her to see her, but 
uh, during the entire year that she was there, the friend only visited her three times, um, and no one else was able to see her. Her partner is, um, Jamie didn't mention this, but just a side note, her partner was also undocumented, so he couldn't come and, and risk his own well-being to see her at the facility. Um, and the final question, how do you think receiving a visit helped you while you were detained? ¿Cómo crees que te ayudó tener esta visita mientras estuviste detenida? ¿Qué tipo de, de apoyo um, te pudimos dar? Pues el apoyo que yo sentí, la verdad fue como, como que tenía un poco más de esperanza porque tenía gente y pues me visitaban y me sentía como que o con un poco más de alegría porque no tenía casi nadie que me fuera a visitar. La verdad para mí ellos fueron un gran apoyo y una experiencia que no tendría cómo explicarlo. Um, she said that it was a huge support for her and again uh, a source of, of joy to, to receive visits and, and um, find that kind of friendship while she was detained because she didn't have anyone else to, to visit her. Um, and I just want to quickly emphasize and I think that it, it's important to celebrate that she was released but you know even after she was released and she had her freedom not everything is necessarily fine. Um, there's kind of a whole different host of problems that um, people coming out of detention experience and were, as a visitation program, we're now trying to, to create that cycle of post-detention support. Next slide. Oh, and those are just pictures of Jamie and her daughter. Um, on the left is uh, Jamie and her daughter, who's also named Jamie. Uh, at a little workshop, and then um, her daughter also just graduated from pre-K. So that's her with her graduation cap. And now I will pass it back to Bob. Great. Thank you, Rocio and Jamie. Um, it's a really inspiring story, and um, I think that everyone in our visitation program who um, has been able to visit the Hutto Detention Center really walks away um, with a similar story um, and a kind of connection to the people who are detained that you can't um, get through reading about um, the issues of detention and immigration that are um, only stories that um, and, and only a connection that you get when you are able to visit and, and actually walk inside of those walls. Um, the next section um, we're going to talk about some of the different kinds of visitation programs. Um, the Hutto Visitation Program is what we would call an informal or unsanctioned visitation program. Um, we are able to get um, we are able to get uh, names of people who are who are seeking a visit from a legal service provider um, here in Austin, and I would encourage congregations to make connections with legal service providers. Um, when we uh, get those names, we send people in. Uh, we do an orientation once a month, and we um, connect people to uh, connect the volunteer visitors to people who are seeking a visit a visitor um, as part of the visitation program but there are other kinds of visitation programs one that develop closer relationships with the detention center themselves um, and for that I'm going to uh, turn it over to um, David Fricaro um, who is one of the founders of the National Visitation Network um, and uh, really a leading voice in this both from the faith perspective and from the, the visitation perspective. And uh, there we see David's face. Um, <laughs> um, uh, welcome, David. And I'll turn it over to you to uh, talk a little bit about the National Visitation Network and um, some of the work that uh, you've been able to do to develop the system of, det of uh, visitation uh, programs around the country. Thanks, Bob. Um, and uh, I just want to note to uh, everyone around the country, um, you know, what a what a privilege it is to be on the phone with folks from grassroots leadership. I think really what you're getting is a snapshot of a model visitation program in the country that not only accompanies people in the midst of um, tremendous suffering, but also finds ways to advocate in the community um, to really hold. Um, the, uh, the administration as well as the, uh, the officials um, in the community and at the jails um, accountable to change. And so they're a real terrific model. 
um, about 60% of the visitation programs across the country are informal programs. And essentially, if any of you on the call right now um, you know, found out that there was a detention um, center near you, um, and you simply went on their website, determined the visitation hours, you were able to connect either with, say, a family member, or maybe a chaplain inside, or perhaps um, a lawyer who was representing somebody inside, you could find out if they were willing to give you um, a person's A number. Um, you can kind of tell the inhumanity of the detention system. When you go and visit somebody, you're really mostly not given their name, but their A number, their alien number. Um, and you can just in that fact see how dehumanizing the system is. But once you receive that A number and you go during visitation hours, you yourself could go right now and essentially you know, become a visitor. However, what we've really recognized is that the best programs uh, around the country really have uh, trained, um, consistent volunteers that have um, a great deal of education on the issue and some real strong ethics. Um, ethics plays a real strong role in visitation. Um, because there's a tremendous power difference between people that go and visit um, who ate what they wanted to in the morning, uh, who wore whatever clothes you know they wanted to wear, and the people who are inside um, who don't have any of that kind of freedom and are in the midst of some deplorable, isolating conditions. And so it's really important to have um, some training for, for visitors to really think deeply about this, um, about these things. Um, if we could... Um, uh, one other point I wanted to make is that um, about 40% of the other programs across the country are, um, are what you might call facility, um, the detention facility approves, or the local ICE field officer, Immigration and Customs Enforcement Regional Field Officer, approves the program. So these are two very different models, um, and um, both have benefits and both have drawbacks. Um, some of the drawbacks of going through um, the facility or the regional ICE officer to approve a visitation program, and one of the major drawbacks is just how much time it takes. You really have to develop relationships um, with the people inside who are not always the easiest to develop relationships with. It includes a lot of meetings, a lot of trust building, um, typically formal applications, and we know visitation programs that that's taken close to two years to, to begin. Um, I think as we have more models of programs that have started, um, I, I think that, that period is getting down to a, hopefully a matter of months. Um, while it's slow, it can lead to a great deal of um, greater access once you get inside. If they trust you, it means you may have expanded visitation hours, you may have the ability in some cases for contact visitation, and you may be able to actually affect a greater change inside by um, really talking with say, the warden of the facility and, and explaining some of your concerns. And if that warden likes you and feels like your visitation program is beneficial to the officers because it, it keeps people inside, uh, many of the reasons they give is, is it keeps the people inside um, calm, um, happy. Some of the officers themselves occasionally are, are bothered by what they see inside and, and, and want them to be, some of them, connected to the outside world. Others don't. I mean, uh, but I would say it's important not to paint all officers and, uh, with, with the same brush. But um, it's really, you know, you have the grassroots leadership model of non-sanctioned but doing, ex and doing excellent visitation work inside and doing great outside uh, advocacy at work. And then you have some other programs like ones in Minnesota um, and uh, in California and Chicago that really have worked tirelessly with uh, the powers that we um, and while well, it's taken a long time, actually, uh, because of that trust, have been able to, to do some really make some strong changes inside of the, the facility. So think about that as you think about beginning your own visitation program. If we could go back to the PowerPoint, possibly. Um, in a moment, we're going to go back to looking at the map. Um, that um, uh, this is just another take on that map. If you were to click on all the kind of pendant-looking blue lights, essentially you'd see three or four. Uh, detention centers under each one of those, um, and you can go to www.endisolation.org, which is one of two um, current uh, visitation network websites um, for, um, for this map. But what we wanted to show there with the light bulbs is those are some of the existing visitation programs. And 
when I look at that, it, at first it's a little bit overwhelming, although when we first started the visitation network, we only had four, and we've expanded to close to 20, and not all of them are, are up there on the screen right now, and that's, that's very impressive considering that the combined budget for, say, all those visitation programs together is probably under $100,000, and it just shows you what a committed group of volunteers can do and make a major difference um, despite very little resources or, or, or funds. But you look at that picture, you're like, man, there needs to be a lot more visitation programs um, uh, out there. Um, but then, and, and there's just not enough visitation programs or other advocacy campaigns, et cetera. But then if you were to take another map and map onto that every UU congregation across the United States with a little standing on the side of Love logo, not to mention all the other houses of worship um, you know, from all the different faiths, they would outnumber those blue dots about 5,000 to 1. And there's absolutely no reason, um, especially in some of these rural areas, not close to city, why a few you congregations and others shouldn't be partnering together to begin visitation programs. So um, a part of, and if we could head to the next slide, um, just to note, and, and I'll, I'll um, speed up here, but um, we head to the next slide if possible. Okay, I'll continue talking. Um, note that um, the, the Visitation Network is simply a group of concerned uh, individuals and visitation programs who simply care deeply about their friends inside of detention. And, and note the word uh, friends. These are not strangers uh, inside of detention, dehumanized strangers. These are friends and people who are um, uh, incredibly courageous and, and resilient. Um, and we essentially come together. Um, we've recognized the benefits of talking to one another, of sharing best practices and stories. Um, we um, have uh, a shared email listserv. We um, are on monthly calls with one another, and we have yearly gatherings uh, together. Um, and part of what's helped to um, bring about more visitation programs is through learning from one another. You'll see here that we've named five main priorities for all visitation programs. Grassroots named a few of them. I'll just add uh, educating the uneducated public on the realities of detention. Guarantee a 90% of people who live within a 20-mile radius of the detention facility have no clue it's even there. Um, being the eyes of ears to the detention facilities um, and, um, and providing services and friendship to family of those in detention. So, um, a wonderful group, um, and um, if you go to www.endisolation.org, you'll see two uh, particular um, uh, um, resources, one about how to begin a new visitation program, um, and one that specifically looks at folks that want to work within the system to begin a visitation program. Both excellent resources. Check them out. Um, and um, I think at the end it was my um, email if you want to join our listserv. I'll end just by noting that I began visiting 10 years ago with a faith-based group out of the Riverside Church that was intentionally um, uh, multicultural um, and interfaith. This picture, you have five different faiths, five different cultures going to visit the detention facility behind. Our yearly budget was $3,000, but we, you know, the group really did a wonderful job to dramatically change lives and ended up inspiring a movie called The Visitor. If you've ever seen the movie, um, it, the director went with this group for six months and uh, was inspired by a particular relationship between one of our visitors who was a college professor and the man inside and ended up um, uh, writing, writing the movie. So do watch The Visitor if you haven't before. Um, so I'll end with just noting um, that I have been extremely impressed as well with standing on the side of love. Um, with your um, with your branding, with how you guys show up, with uh, the interfaith and multicultural uh, aspects um, to to your work, um, and uh, we just encourage you to to really take a lead on this. I think you can do some wonderful things, um, and um, and 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 don't underestimate those broken down ministry tables with the little sign saying begin a visitation program after service. People will respond. That's how I got involved and. I was a lowly actor 10 years ago, shortly after 9-11, and now I'm an ordained pastor because I was inspired through visitation um, programs with people of many different faiths and cultures. So thank you very much for, uh, for listening, and I hope the, uh, the Visitation Network can continue to be a resource for you. Thank you, David. Um, David is really one of those um, people who've been doing this for a very long time and um, are one of the really leading voices in this movement to start visitation programs. Um, next, we're going to um, kick it over to Jan Meslin from the Tapestry UU Church in Mission Viejo. 
Um, I got the pleasure of meeting Jan in January um, when I was in Southern California um, talking um, about uh, detention visitation um, and the prison system uh, to a couple different congregations in Southern California. Um, and Jan has uh, started a visitation program uh, there out of the Tapestry UU Church. And we would love to hear a little bit about your experience this, Jan. Hi, Jan. I'm not sure. I think you need to unmute yourself. OK. Here we go. Great. Hi. After almost two years, Years of relationship building, purposed meetings, and trainings, one of which was facilitated by grassroots leadership, we, Detention Dialogues Orange County, will make our first official visit in September to the James Music Facility in Irvine, Irvine, California, which houses immigration detainees. More than five years ago, several of us at Tapestry became passionate about immigration reform because we had made friends with the immigrant community in nearby San Juan Capistrano. How did we do this? At OCO Community Organizing Meetings, where we are both members. OCO is an acronym for the Orange County Congregation Community Organization. It's a local affiliate under the PICO Organizing Network. Through our partnerships with this group called CREER, Comunidad y Familia, we have heard our friends' stories of fear and courage, and we want to use our power to help. At Tapestry, five of us facilitated a one-on-one -on -one listening campaign to talk with our congregational members. And what came out of these meetings was a desire to visit immigrants who might be isolated in detention to witness what is going on. We are honoring the dignity of every human being, and we want them to know they are not alone. We have learned much through our meetings with local immigration attorneys, ex-detainees, other visitation programs, in Northern California, uh, James Music, jail staff, and a sheriff's department. And just as important, we've built trust on all ends. This may help us in the future with advocacy efforts. We've been unable to meet with our ICE field manager, but we're still trying. But our program was approved by the music facility, um, kind of in, in an informal manner, I guess. In fact, they asked us if we're willing to visit at the other two centers in Orange County. So they want us to. Each facility is different. We must abide by the particular guidelines as well as the county's guidelines. In Orange County, all immigrant detainees are housed in county jails. We don't have private centers. And this is fortunate, we think, because the guidelines are more enforceable. And there actually are laws in the jails. At Music, there's a big visitor room with long tables. There are both men and women. Um, it's also the county jail, but there are separate barracks for the immigration detainees. We will sit across the table from the people we're visiting. Detainees right now can have up to three one-half-hour visits per week. But I like listening to David, and, and we actually have talked about maybe we can build up some trust and have longer visits, more visits. Two attorneys who do monthly legal orientation programs find us detainees who desire visitors, and then they give us the A numbers. They pass out a form we designed when they do their monthly LOP, legal orientation programs. We make it clear on the form that we do not give legal help. We're simply there to be with them if they feel lonely, confused, bored. Right now, we have 15 trained people from four UU congregations in Orange County. We have plans to make this an interfaith group and to get more clergy involved. And we will also expand our services to help family members if desired. Finally, we are lucky to share learning with the first UU Church in San Diego who are also engaged in detention ministry. Their program was developed as an action next step after the six session immigration as a moral issue class. And they have brought interfaith partners to their effort. They are about to begin visits at the Otay Mesa CCA facility private corporation CCA. Please contact Angela Garcia Sims or me if you have questions. And you should see us on the slide right now. Thank you. Bob? 
Terrific. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, and here we have some pictures of the uh, Great Visitation Group um, out of the Tapestry UU Church in Mission Viejo. Um, at this point, um, we are going to, I think, go to Susan Leslie, who's going to, uh, and here you have some contact information for both grassroots leadership um, and for the National Visitation Network. I really do encourage you to get in touch with us, um, uh, Rocio and myself, and uh, David, um, and the folks from uh, Mission Viejo and San Diego UU Churches, um, because I really do think that this is a program that um, can be accomplished um, and is something that can really both inform your advocacy efforts around immigration and provide some real relief for people um, in detention who are really looking for, for someone to talk to. Um, at this point, we're going to kick it over to, um, to Susan Leslie, um, who I think is going to shepherd us through a couple of the questions that have been coming over the the chat. And if you have any questions that you would like um, any of the speakers who've been on the call this, thus far to answer, um, please do put them into the, the chat portion of the webinar, which is under over um, on the right-hand side, right under questions. So Susan, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Susan Leslie here at the UUA. Bob, one of the questions that came up, that came up is a uh, number of speakers talked about sanctioned visitation programs. And the question is, who sanctions them? Yeah, um, for us, uh, when we decided to um, start the Hutto Visitation Program, we decided that um, because of our previous relationship with the Hutto Detention Center, we had advocated to have that facility closed down when it was a family detention facility. Um, we decided that we weren't going to ask permission um, from Immigration and Customs Enforcement to visit people at the detention center. Um, we simply decided that we wanted to um, to uh, start visiting people um, in solidarity with them. Um, I think that there are different models depending on the kind of detention center. Um, so we consider ourselves an unsanctioned visitation program because we did not ask Corrections Corporation of America or Immigration and Customs Enforcement if we could start visiting. We simply um, started showing up and saying that we were friends um, of the people that we were visiting in detention. Um, there are different models, um, and depending on the kind of facility, you may actually have to um, get permission from the um, from the detention center before starting to visit um, due to visitation rules. Um, I think David and, and Jan can certainly attest that it varies depending on the detention center what the visitation rules are. If you need previous um, clearance um, to enter the facility, if you need to be on a visitation list of the person that you're visiting. Um, there's a, sort of a whole host of rules that vary uh, detention facility by detention facility. But that's what we mean by unsanctioned. And, and by sanctioned, um, we mean having contacted Immigration and Customs Enforcement or the detention facility before you start actually visiting. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Um, another uh, question. Did somebody uh, else want to answer that question before I move on? Um, I can answer something. Can you hear me? Yep. This is Jan. Um, the, the, the visitation program in Northern California called Detention Dialogues is an, officially an ICE-approved facility, so they've gone to the ICE field managers. And they have developed it. The, the ICE managers are all different, too. Some of them are better than others, of course. But they, ICE actually has given them um, an extension, a phone extension that's pro bono so that the detainees can call them and call the visitors network and have communication that way, which is wonderful. That's great. Thank you, Jan. Um, another question that came up is um, there's someone from Seattle who actually has a friend or family member in Georgia. And um, this question has come to me as well in emails. Is there a network set up for people to be able to contact folks saying, I've got someone who needs a visitor. I can um, I can begin to take that. This is this is David. Um, I mean, yes, that's part of what the network is helping to do. So by joining the list serve, you can put that out on the visitation list serve network, um, and and anybody that's within a certain radius there 
um, who has a visitation program in that area could go out and visit that person. In Georgia, for instance, we have an outstanding visitation program run by a group called Alterna, a faith-based group, A-L-T-E-R-N-A, -E that visits in southern um, and central Georgia. Um, and so anytime we in North Carolina, when we have somebody um, detained, um, most of the detention centers there are just processing units where people will stay for six, six to 12 days and then be sent and separated for their family five, six hours away in, in Georgia. And thankfully, we have good enough relationships with this group, Alperna, who will go with both and, and visit, it, visit that group. And they also have a home for families from North Carolina around the area to actually stay overnight within, I think, like five miles of the detention facility. So they're a great model for what that kind of connection looks like. Thank you. We're also getting several people asking again, how do you find out if there's a detention center in your area and if there are people already doing or trying to organize a visitation program? And also if we might be able to share uh, information with people on this call about um, people in the same area who are wanting to get something going. I can also just note that on www detention watch network detention watch network dot org backslash visitation you'll see about three quarters of the current visitation groups that are out there you'll see where they're located and you'll see the contact names and emails for those folks so that's going to be a great first step and then I would say just email me at David Fricaro at yahoo.com and I'll join you to the visitation network listserv and anybody who, if the information is not up there or you want more, you could just send an email out to that listserv. And, and, um, and uh, we also will have two new employees, the Christinas. Um, you'll get to know them soon. But uh, they're going to be tasked with in this coming year. They, want, they actually want a prestigious fellowship to begin to strengthen the network. Um, again, they'll be there to actually help people through that process um, to strengthen existing programs and start new ones. Thank you. I'll also add um, from the UUA side that we'll be sending out a follow-up, um, just quick survey about how the uh, usefulness of this webinar was, but also to find out what people are involved in and if you would like to be connected with others. Uh, another question that we've been getting is, are there community-based alternatives to detention? Um, this is Bob, and, and, and I can answer that. Um, there are um, there are some really terrific programs around the country. Uh, here in Austin, we have a program called Casa Marianella. Um, that is a shelter for folks um, who are getting out of detention or who are um, political or economic uh, migrants or refugees um, who, who have never been in detention. Um, and this is a really terrific program. Uh, uh, shelter that uh, houses men, women, and families. Um, unfortunately, I think that there are far too few of these programs around the country. Um, and unfortunately, Immigration and Customs Enforcement often doesn't release people who are detained to, um, to shelter or shelter-like facilities. Um, you know, there are 34,000 people who are detained on any given day, and there are far fewer than that who are, are housed in um, you know, community-based alternative programs. Um, I think that that is changing to some extent. Um, I know that there is a pilot project uh, that has been launched by Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services in a few communities around the country that are um, that are developing and expanding these community-supported uh, uh, alternatives to detention programs uh, by partnering legal service providers with shelter operators like Casa Marianella. Um, I also know uh, that there are folks in, I believe, Southern California and perhaps other parts of the country who work on um, trying to provide bond for people um, who are in immigration detention. Because oftentimes there is a um, unreasonable and, and um, unmeetable bond that is set on people um, in order to get out of detention. So you'll often have people who uh, languish in immigration detention um, uh, even when they've been, you know, cleared to get out if they were only able to pay a bond. So um, those are two examples of, of alternatives to detention and, and ways people are trying to get folks out of detention. 
Thank you. We also have a question from an immigrant who's living here with a green card who wants to know if there would be any issues with uh, them participating in a visitation program. Um, this is Bob, and, and no, there there should not be. Um, we have several folks who are not um, who are not citizens, but are legal residents who are part of our visitation program. Um, I would advise that you make sure that um, everything is in order um, in terms of your status, and that there aren't out, any outstanding criminal convictions that might jeopardize your status in the United States. Um, because uh, immigration enforcement officers who are at detention centers are law enforcement officers um, some of the time, and they do have the power to arrest you um, if you are not um, if you are not uh, in the correct status, or you have a criminal conviction that might that might jeopardize your status. Um, we don't advise that people who are undocumented or whose status is in question visit people who are, are detained through a visitation program. Thanks, Bob. A um, uh, last question that I have is, um, are any ESL classes taught at detention centers through these programs? And uh, a related question was, you know, what role can people who speak other languages play as part of this program? I know that um, one particularly important connection, especially for faith-based groups, to find out about prior to visiting is the chaplain inside. There's some terrific chaplains and there's some not so great um, chaplains inside. But they oftentimes are responsible for bringing in um, uh, pastoral um, presences, some ordained, some not, in to fill the different need, religious needs of the folks inside. And I have heard of some innovative programs through the chaplain services um, that will bring in both you know, elements of, of ministry to fill those religious needs, but that can include some elements of social service. Um, I think a lot of that kind of depends upon what the, that particular facility is willing to allow, and that's part of the reason why building better relations might lead to better innovative programs. You know, I thought about maybe trying to do like a an acting class inside. You know, they have some pretty innovative programs in some prisons, so to to at least um, consider. And, and just briefly on the on the piece with the other languages. A lot of visitors sometimes freak out because they don't speak the same language as the person they're going to visit. I don't blame folks. I did for the first two years of visiting. But what's key in, about visitation is that people are just thrilled to see somebody that, that doesn't have their arms crossed, that has empathy in their eyes. And if you can breathe through the silences and you both know that you're there despite language challenges um, because you care, um, that really registers. And sometimes I've seen connections that go deeper when you don't speak the same language. Um, and and it's, it's kind of remarkable um, to see that nonverbal communication used. Thank you, David. That's quite a beautiful note to um, end our question and answer portion on. And I'll, and I'll send it back to our moderator. Uh, thank you so much, um, David and, and Jan and Susan and Dan and Audra for, for everything. Um, uh, there was one other question that I thought that um, Rocio might be able to answer. Um, can visitors bring children to see their parents? And this is something that, that we've experienced. So I'm going to hand it over to Rocio just to answer that question very quickly. Hi. Um, so yes. Um, visitors can bring the children of people who are detained to see their parents. Um, I think it provides a great relief to see that their children are doing well, but at the same time, I've heard the women express how hurtful it can also be to, to see their children, but then to, to be separated from them again and to know that they can't stay with their child. But uh, yes, they are allowed to visit. and um, it helps at least keep that bond and keep that, um, try to maintain at least some sense of normalcy and something that is an experience that is so um, dehumanizing and um, really painful. Um, but yes, children are allowed to visit. Great. Um, thank you, Rocio. Um, 
as we wrap up, um, I would really encourage people to contact, um, um, you know, there's been a question about some of the step-by-step -step, um, uh, um, instructions on how to start programs. Um, and, and what I would say to that is that there, it really does depend on um, your congregation and your, um, and, the, and the detention center that is near you and uh, what your congregation decides to do. Um, in terms of, of developing a relationship with ICE or not. Um, I think that one of the best ways to really start thinking through some of these questions um, is to join the National Visitation Network calls that happen on a monthly basis um, because re these really are an opportunity to talk not only with you know, grassroots leadership and, and, and some of the other uh, local organizations, but also with some of the national people who have been involved in several of these visitation um, programs around the country. So I think that that's really the best way to bounce ideas off of um, people around the country to share best practices, um, you know, and, to, and to, to, to build some of that support. So I do encourage you to email um, Rocio, uh, myself, or David um, to, to, um, to continue this conversation. Um, and I'm going to turn it um, uh, back over to Dan to sort of uh, uh, close us out. Dan, if you don't mind. Hi, Dan. You might need to unmute yourself. I may have put Dan on the spot there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Dan. Um, um, I, well, I can go ahead and, and close this out just by really expressing uh, appreciation to Standing on the Side of Love and the UUA um, for making this a priority um, and making um, uh, reforming the immigration system and developing deeper relationships with um, the people who are in uh, immigration detention and deportation. I really think that uh, when you think about the phrase Standing on the Side of Love, it can mean many things. Um, but uh, certainly going into a detention center and developing a relationship with somebody um, who is, who's feeling the full brunt of immigration enforcement policy, um, there's no better way um, to do that. And so um, I'm very much looking forward to working with many of you as we move ahead in developing these visitation programs. Um, and in a year or two, I would love to see far fewer of those detention centers on that map and far uh, more of the light bulbs of the, of the visitation programs um, around the country. Um, so thank you very much, and um, we'll certainly be in touch. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you, everybody. Oh, he's there. Good. Yeah. Uh, technological difficulties, but hopefully everybody found this really valuable. And I, I just want to thank Bob and Rocio and Jan and David um, for joining us and doing such a fantastic job, and Jamie for uh, as well. So thank you, and everybody have a wonderful night, and let's consider this the first step. Good night. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Thanks. Good night, everyone. They had a hundred people, three hundred.